Welcome to Healing Generations, a podcast creating a dialogue uplifting the importance of healing, strengthening, and supporting our communities, and that addresses the disparities and inequities in communities of color. Healing Generations is brought to you by the Healing Generations Institute, a collaborative initiative of the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on our new releases. Well, welcome and uh, many blessings to all of you. Uh, my name is Jerry Teo and uh, here with the Healing Generations podcast that uh, is brought to you by the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders and, and so many others that have contributed to, uh, to this journey. We are, um, again, very blessed and pleased to, to have with us uh, uh, Till Narayan, Dr. Narayan, a good friend, a colleague, uh, brother, um, just an amazing spirit. Uh, and this is the, the second part of, uh, of two dialogues that we're having. So if you didn't listen to the first one, listen to the first one. And, and then we're going to continue here today in which we uh, began last time talking really about some ancestral teachings uh, that Attil talked about coming from Fiji and his, uh, the medicine that comes from, uh, from the heritage of, of those uh, indigenous people here that, that he embodies that he carries, uh, and he carries on. And, and um, as we finished last session, we, uh, we began to talk about then his journey into um, to the medicine that he's doing now, the, the, the work that he's doing now. But I want to, before we get into that, just uh, welcome you again, Atil, and, and allow you just to say a few words to, to connect with the audience, and then we'll get on with our discussion. So, Well, thank you so much, uh, Brother Jerry, for having me on here. It's a huge honor for me to be able to uh, speak, share, uh, and uh, and just be in this space with you. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, we've had so many talks that I've literally recorded into my brain and I've played over and over again. There are lessons and teachings, uh, wisdom that you have that I get right away and some stuff it reveals to me more later as I grow and evolve. And so... Uh, to be able to be here in this space with you, uh, it's, I consider it a huge honor and a privilege. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I appreciate you having me uh, come on to share uh, what little bit I can share. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot that we could share. We could, <laughs> and, we, and we will. We'll continue dialoguing. Uh, but you know, for for this session, I really just wanted to talk about you know, I mean, you have that uh, you know that heritage and 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 that. Uh, genetic memory of, of your people that has been passed through you, passed on to you. But then um, you, know, you came upon, I think we were, we were talking a little bit about this last time, um, you know, a, a path by which you could combine and connect that traditional uh, ancestral me- medicine with, uh, with Western medicine here or to being able to do it in, I guess, in a legitimate way. I don't know if it's Western medicine, but, it, but so I want I wanted to, to just invite you to talk a little bit about that, about what drew you into doing this work as an acupuncturist, as a, as a, as a healer this way, and, uh, and, and, you know, how'd you got to that journey? Sure. So when I was in college, I began to do a lot of readings, uh, studying, uh, praying with uh, indigenous people and native people. And the type of books I would read would be Black Elk Speaks. Uh, I would, uh, I read the Tao Te Ching. I would read uh, certain scriptures of my own tradition and heritage. And I would try to actualize those teachings and those lessons. And so what I found was that some of the most, you know, they say, be careful who your heroes are uh, and, and study your heroes because they'll tell you about, about you. And so where I come from, the heroes that I found the most fascinating were the shamans, the mystics, the, the spiritual scholars, if you will. And these were people that weren't just uh, herbalist or medicine men and women, but they also embodied a certain spiritual power. So mm-hmm. spirituality and medicine or spirituality and healing, uh, prayer and healing, it was always combined. Mm-hmm. And so through 
my attraction and my love of that, then I, at some point, uh, my brother Vic and I, we ended up uh, working at a, uh, it's a pharmacy, but they have uh, herbs, vitamins, uh, minerals, supplements, all sorts of amazing uh, things. Uh, it's, a call, it's called Capital Drugs in Sherman Oaks, California. And then, and while we were working there, there were these ladies that would, that just knew everything about everything, right? Mm-hmm. In terms of homeopathy, in terms of uh, aromatherapy, uh, and they just welcomed us in. We were, you know, that it was, I think I was 22 years old at that time. Mm. And they welcomed us in and they began teaching us. And while I was there, I then found out, I had heard about that there was a master's degree program in Chinese medicine. Mm. And so my preference at that time was Ayurveda, which is the traditional medicine of people from my heritage, which is Indian people that go back to South Asia. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't a licensure for that. It wasn't something that was recognized by any insurance company, let alone the government, you know. Mm. And so if I did do Ayurveda, then I'd have to be very careful as to what I put on my business cards and so on and so forth. But I found out that Chinese medicine, there was actually a licensure. And this is, you know, uh, Governor Jerry Brown back in the 70s Mm. uh, signed us into law. And so we were legal since then. And so at that time, I said, you know, this would be perfect because it's rooted in ancient philosophy but it's something that is, and I put this in quotes, within the system of the conventional culture here. Mm -hmm. And so that was my initial attraction to Chinese medicine. What I didn't realize then, and I so realize now, was when I made that commitment to spend the thousands and thousands of dollars to earn a master's degree in Chinese medicine, thankfully, I had the type of parents that didn't say to me, hey, kid, before you spend that much money, on a master's degree, why don't you open up the classifies and see how many people are hiring for that job? Mm. Because it wasn't a real (laughs) career at that time, okay? Even right now, when you look at government statistics and the careers, uh, acupuncture doesn't pop up on the radar. Mm -hmm. But at that time, and such a, a, and and maybe maybe sometimes, you know, when you don't have your prefrontal cortex, that part of you that has to do with long-term decision-making or impulse control. (laughs) I was younger than 24 years old, uh, and I signed up. And once I made the commitment, I I saw it through. And if at that time somebody came and told me, hey, this this journey that you're on, it's not going to be easy, and nobody's just going to hand you anything. But if you stay true to it, that there's going to come a day where medical doctors will refer patients to your office, where attorneys are going to refer their clients. You're going to have relationships with attorneys. You're going to have be in contract with all the major insurance carriers and payers that are in the healthcare system. Mm-hmm. You're going to be able to treat warriors through the Veterans Administration and on and on and on. And so I felt like my journey into this sort of healing system is exactly classic Dr. Joseph Campbell. If you follow your bliss, bliss meaning that your spirit is calling you to it, and that's your contract Mm. with the universe, that even if systems do not exist, Mm. that the seas have to part and it will and must come true. Mm -hmm. And so... There's different ways to go. I have uh, uh, colleagues of mine that have an all cash business that do not at all deal with the healthcare system per se. Uh, And then I went a different route. I I chose to deal with the system. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, you know, and and this doesn't make me any better than anybody. It's my my reason and my rationale was is, hey, if you can learn the system and how it works, and how to not just function, but to be able to thrive within that system. And in a small, tiny little pebble way that creates a small ripple effect to be able to then be part of that movement that can have a paradigm shift in the larger system, Mm -hmm. then go for it. Learn the system. Mm -hmm. Learn the language, because how many languages have you learned already? Mm -hmm. Just being able to adapt to this particular culture. Mm 
but make yourself that promise. And I remember being on my hands and knees long before I had my license, uh, just praying to the creator and saying that if you create this path forward for me, that I will never, ever forget what this is all about. Mm. And it's about that healing. It's about that transformation. And mm. so even within the system, and knock on wood, thankfully, all these years later, I feel like I've been able to have the spirit of what this is all about intact working within the system. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned the spirit of the work. And so when I met you, um, you hadn't uh, arrived to, to really doing acupuncture yet. You, When I met you, you were doing um, work with energy, with, with um, helping people energetically and balancing them and, and um, you know, and, and what I'm interested in is is how did you um, how did you arrive there to know that you embodied you know some of that ancestral medicine that could feel spirit that could know spirit and that part of your role that was sent to you was to help people balance their energy and their spirit. Can you can you talk a little bit about that because I think you know the journey that I remember is that you were on that path and then you arrived to how do we you know kind of if you will, legitimize this in a larger, sure. you know, Western systemic uh, way? At different points in my life, I would have answered that differently. And mm. so at this point in my life, the way I would answer that is, is I, I'm now realizing after having been to my father's village, that there's that sense of sacredness and that sense of spirituality that they carry. Uh, mm. There are certain things that they know to be sacred. My father, no matter which level of the government that he worked in, he carried that sense of spirituality, of that sacredness. We had that in the, in the household. And he was very philosophical. So he introduced us to uh, the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa or, or the teachings of Swami Vivekananda. And so that spiritual identity was at the core of my spiritual journey. When I started to study Chinese medicine school, I mean, Chinese medicine formally, and I went to Ch the school that I went to, uh, there were different schools at that time. And at that time, I chose Samra University of Oriental Medicine. Their main sales pitch to me at that time is, is we value Eastern and Western equally. And at that point in time, it just kind of made sense to me. Okay, it sounds good. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there were other schools that were on the Santa Monica side that were really Taoist and really spiritual and really philosophical and deeply rooted in generation and generation of the Taoist heritage behind uh, Asian medicine. And so after being in my school about a month or two, there was a little bit of, uh, how shall we say, uh, many revolution brewing amongst some of the students who... <laughs> had gone to those Taoist schools and came back and said, hey, man, they're doing a whole other thing over there. And they meditate and they have a meditation room and so on and so forth. And over here, we're being taught communist acupuncture. Oh. Yeah. And so, uh, so you know, and, and so I was like, okay, well, when are you guys going over there? Let's go. So I went over there too and I came back. Mm. And there was a professor, uh, Dr. Amir Zagros, uh, that... Uh, I really liked, I mean, he, you know, he had this, uh, you know, he was this Persian guy, slick hair, you know, shirt and tie and that whole thing. And in those days, you know, I had long hair and braids and khakis, you know, creased khakis. <laughs> and, um, and, and Amir was really cool. And, and I had asked him one time about this, like I was thinking about making that transition, that move. And, and he said to me, he goes, he goes, look, we don't know if our field, if this license is, is going to exist. It's so new. It's, it's so tentative. He goes, get your license. Get it as soon as possible. And that spirit, that's something that's inside of you. That's something that you're going to cultivate. That's not something you buy and somebody gives to you. That's yours. Mm. Mm. And when he said that, man, I stayed put and I learned what I had to do and I graduated from that school. But I, what he gave to me was that if you have it, then then it's in you to find it. And ultimately, that's what the teachings say. Mm. And so wherever I went and, and, and the different people and the traditions that I prayed with, it's the healers that I could, you know, we were taught in the philosophies of, of medicine that 
you know, you have good doctors that can give you the proper herbal prescription and they give it to you. But if they give you the right prescription with a bad hand, with a bad intent, the medicine won't mm. help. Wow. And if they give you the wrong prescription with the right intent, if they give it to you with a good hand, then you will get better. Wow. Then you have herbalists that are uh, medicine people that are at the next level beyond that. And there are herbalists that will uh, can heal you with water. They can put that medicine and that intent into that water. You can drink the water, you can heal. And we know this to be true because every tradition on the planet talks about holy water. Mm -hmm. And then there are medicine that can heal you with a word. Mm. And they call it mantra, right? Uh, they call it affirmation. They call it word vibrations. Um, and, and, and so here, this is your mantra. This is your word vibration. You repeat this. And you say that to yourself and let those vibrations go deep into your inner psyche. So there are, there are healers that can heal with the word. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these mythologies behind the philosophies of these traditional medicine. And so some of these, literally, when you start out, you're like, oh, my God, like, I, I, I don't know if I'll ever get to that deep, <laughs> deep level. But then you get around elders and uh, I've had the honor and the privilege of praying with many elders. And boy, you, you lit, like I, you've seen people with hearts of stone melt. And you've mm. seen how prayer can transform. Mm. And so I started it with pure philosophy, pure energy, pure intent. And so in, in Chinese medical philosophy or just Chinese philosophy in general, they have the yin and yang symbol, the old mm -hmm. surfer symbol, right? The black and white with a circle. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and then so the light and the dark, right? The the yin and the yang, the, the night and the day. And, and one can't, you know, the spirit, the unseen and the manifest, the physical that is seen. The, I, I've learned to appreciate the that some of us need the physicality of it. Right. Some of us can heal with the spirit, but not all of us can heal with the spirit. Sometimes you have to go through the physicality, through working, physically working on the body. A hug goes a long way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just in our own interpersonal relationships. Sometimes you're having a bad day and your children or your, or your loved one, or your husband or your wife, it just comes and just gives you a hug. And that hug that says, okay, we can release that right now. You know, just mm. for this moment, let's just release it. And we will revisit it. Just the appreciation of, professionally speaking, I can't hug my patients. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the hug is a metaphor of just physically working on the body mm -hmm. with the intent of, and there are sometimes a knee pain is just a knee pain or a back pain is just a back pain. And sometimes a back pain is more than just a back pain. It's the burdens, mm -hmm. the emotional burdens or the ancestral burdens you've been carrying. You work with an intent of let's figure out which one of these it is. Oftentimes the patient may not know. Oftentimes it's not you with a crystal ball you can see that knows, but it is revealed. And it might be revealed in the language. It might be revealed in creating that sacred space where they just might say certain things like, oh, man, I've been carrying this for a long time. Hmm. Oh, okay. You know, so in my head, okay, let's find out how long. Mm -hmm. And then so sometimes you then share aspects of that. And, um, and the, just connecting the dots is enough. And then it's one of those things of, you know, sometimes you can try to move something. And the more you try to move it, it doesn't move. Hmm. But sometimes you can ask it to move, and then it moves. Mm. Wow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so, you know, there's, there's different dynamics that come into play. So I feel okay. like working within the system was a, a challenge for me. How can you carry that spirit without having a label that I'm an energy mm -hmm. worker? Mm -hmm. How can you walk into the room with your credentials, but also walk into the room with prayer? and in prayer. Wow. 
And so I think, and I feel really, really blessed that the team that I have at the office, we're all work within the system, but, you know, the core team that we have now recognizes that and understands yeah, that yeah, we, we yeah. try to cultivate that there. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, you mentioned different parts of the body and we, we recognize that, you know, I mean, the body keeps the score, you know, for whatever is going on with us. And not only what's going on with us, what's going on previous to us. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the generational pain, you know, and I always talk about that trauma that's not transformed gets transferred, yeah. you know. So um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, trauma? And it can be physical, emotional, mental, sure. or spiritual trauma. Sure. And how that gets, you know, transferred to the body and how that gets carried and, and how you see that, you know, in, in the dual form uh, that, that you look at the world and, 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 uh, and do your work. Yeah. So every emotion has a chemical counterpart. Mm. And so this is science now, right? So modern science now affirms what we've known in spiritual and traditional circles for a long time. Every emotion has these biochemicals that flood our bodies. And every chemical counterpart to these emotions have receptor sites. And these receptor sites, according to modern anatomy and physiology, is stored. These receptor sites are found everywhere inside the body, all over the place. So when you are angry, you're not just angry, like, oh, he he was so angry, he blew his top off, right? Like, you're not Mm -hmm. just angry in your head. You're also angry in your liver, Mm. and you've carried that now. Mm -hmm. If you are afraid, it's not just, oh, he was so scared, like you could see the fear in in their eyes or something, right? Like you are are scared in your body as well. Mm. So these emotions have these chemicals, these physical chemicals, measurable chemicals, they're a real thing. So your fear is not an abstract thing. It is a real thing. Mm -hmm. So these fear chemicals then are stored in your body. Mm. And so the body is a manufacturing plant. It just manufactures these things. And they're there for a reason. Like a fair amount of fear when that lion pops out from the forest in the night, your your heart is supposed to race because your fear automatically triggers adrenaline and your heart starts to pump. Mm -hmm. What ends up happening, and that's a good thing, that will save your life, right? Mm -hmm. A certain amount of nervousness before a job interview will likely get you the job interview because you're on point. All the Mm -hmm. words happen to appear when you appear. But what happens in chronic stress or chronic fear or chronic anger? Mm -hmm. And so we all have have a median, right, which becomes our normal. So normal used to be that you were born in love, you were held, you were received, and there was song and there was dance and there was a welcoming. And that was your normal, Mm. just being nurtured. But what happens when you're in an environment where it's constant stress? What happens to the person that's in stress and then the person that has now entered that situation where there's constant stress? Mm-hmm. Whether you're aware of it or not, because energy's like a magnet, right? Uh, unless you're a sociopath or you're an enlightened monk, where you can turn it on <laughs> or off, right? But most of us begin to vibe with the people that you're around. Mm. I believe one of the reasons why they invented meditation in in, in India is, is because if you're around a whole bunch of dysfunction at a certain point, you have to now separate yourself from that dysfunction. Mm-hmm. And go find that sacred space and get yourself into that equilibrium mm-hmm. and create a new safe place where your heart rate is yeah. down, your breathing is better, your voice is a lot more calm. Now, what happens is when that in chronic trauma situation, the tolerance level is much higher. So we have higher tolerance of anger, higher tolerance of fear. Very few things scare us. And when something scares you, you must really be scary. Mm. But what that has done to our physiology, which is not designed to go, it's designed to go maybe a couple of hours until you outrun somebody, uh, you know, chasing Mm -hmm. you. But it's not designed to go on days after days after days, weeks, months, year Mm. after year. 
Mm-hmm. So that, in a physiological sense, then breeds that it, uh, chronic inflammation. And so then we have different uh, self-medication that we do just to get ourselves to feel okay. But we haven't gotten back to resetting our clock. Wow. And with regard to your question about the trauma that's been passed around from generation to generation, the imagery, the analogy that comes into my mind is this wonderful movie called Whale Rider and a scene out of that movie. And in this movie, it talks about a people... Uh, from New Zealand, the traditional people of New Zealand called the Maori people. And in this movie, you have a grandfather that's speaking to the granddaughter. And these are a seafaring people. So they have a really close, intimate relationship with the ocean, like a lot of island uh, people. And so uh, their ancient totem pole or totem, animal totem representation is the whale. And so you have the grandfather who is weaving rope and he holds the ends of the rope with all these tiny little fibers exposed from the rope. And he shows to the granddaughter those fibers. And he says, you see, each of these individual fibers are each of us individually. But you see what we're connected to And what you eventually see as the camera kind of pans out is that each of those fibers is part of this rope that just kind of winds and winds and winds around for a very long time. And so when I think about trauma that's been passed around from generations, there's two aspects of that analogy that stands out to me. One is is the individual fiber part. That's each of us as individuals and all the lessons and all of the uh, trials and tribulations, all of the pains, the sufferings, and the triumphs, all the good things that have happened to us, each of us as individuals, we have our own stories and our own lessons and our own, uh, as Dr. Carol Dweck would say, growth mindset moments where we uh, go through a situation and we learn from it. And what do we learn from it? And how do we grow from it? But also on a meta level, on a, on a big level, each of those fibers is connected to a lineage, a heritage. And that lineage and that heritage of uh, survival and of triumph and of all the things that we've gone through, we're also, as individuals, connected to a long sea of people uh, that have passed forward Uh, through genetic information, but also through oral tradition, uh, coding and information on how to survive and the lessons that we've learned. So many years ago, uh, I I had the privilege of meditating with a brother of mine. His name is uh, Banendra. uh, And he was part of an organization called the Anand Mark Movement. And in there, uh, one of the dadas, one of the uh, meditation uh, teachers, a monk, uh, taught us about how we have each of us an individual karma, each of us an individual dharma, uh, what we came here with and what we are to do to live that through, uh, to find our purpose and to find our own personal enlightenment. But each of us as individuals are part of a family circle and the family has its own karma and the family has its own dharma. And you have your neighborhood or your community And each of those have their own karma and their own dharma, their their path forward. And then we might be part of a uh, a national identity or national consciousness, um, and then a global, and then a cosmic. And then so there are so many different levels of healing to be able to touch upon. And so be it the individual or be it the collective, it's uh, a huge part of how we move forward is to be able to look at different levels of it and to address each of it individually. They say that if you are able to heal yourself, then you're going to set forth an energy matrix that is supposed to then ripple through those that are closest around you. So not only do we have a biological family, but the spiritual family that is able to receive the information that we have when we're about uh, transcending 
our immediate condition and the healing that we're having. So your healing doesn't just stay with you. Your healing then will expand out into your immediate community. Yeah. You know, um, so many things there that you, 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 you talked about. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things is, is ceremony. And I, I heard that as ceremony is what you were talking about, that when we are reminded, uh, and you talked about being loved and nurtured and cared for, so that in traditional ceremony, there's, you know, you go, if you go into sweat lodge, you're in the mother's womb. Yeah. If, you, if you're in, in other traditions, you're singing uh, generational songs that your great, great, great grand ancestors sang that remind us of our sacredness, remind us of our holiness, if you will, remind us of our wholeness, right? So that all that fear or that anxiety or that stress can, can drop off, becomes a cleansing of that's not who you are, that's what's happening around you. Let us remind you of who you are and balance you even for that moment, right? And I think that, that you know, what you point to is the significance of recognizing that, you know, we live in an environment and a world that is sometimes not very friendly, you know, and, and actually is hostile. You know, in this environment now in which, you know, we're recognizing the, the significance of uh, the impact that racism has had, that oppression has had, you know, over generations, and now the, the health implications for many indigenous people and people of color. You know, we, we see it now in COVID, right? Because the, the numbers of, for people of color are a lot higher. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, and, and so that's the generational aspects um, that are really impacting us. And I, you know, so I appreciate you, you really talking, you know, about um, not only the ceremony that's important that we, we must incorporate in our lives, we must refamiliarize ourselves or or um, recover yeah. but also you know the you know recognizing that the physiological things that we're going through yeah. are not just physiological yeah. are not just of the body but of are of many many things right, right? you know and 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 I wonder if you could speak to um, a little bit about you know how you interpret what's going on now you know, in, in this universe with, I mean, COVID-19, you know, is really um, challenging, you know, many, many people in many ways, not just in, in health ways, but it's, people are afraid. Yeah. People are, are, anxiety is going up, you know, depression, I mean, all of these things, and I'm sure you see it in your office, but also that coupled with the other pandemic of racism, yeah. you know, and, and how that affects our well-being. Uh, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that and, and how you see that in, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of, you know, the people that you see. Yeah. Racism is one of those things that I originally viewed at, as something that was happening to you. Mm. Uh, if you, my ancestors were part of the colonial system, so I felt as if racism was something that had happened to us. Mm. And then long after the British had left, the moment that they left, then I felt like it was something, and, I, and I'm not sure if it was something all along, or I'm just drawing this contrast, that, that at some point it is something that I feel as if we had also participated in. Mm. Certainly in, in my ancestral bloodline. So when the Britishes, when they first came in, before they came in, uh, we had uh, centuries of uh, rules from other uh, invaders that had come in. And prior to them coming in, then you had the different rajas that were there. And there's this really cool book called Godan uh, that was written by an author named Prem Natset that talked about how you had the landowners and you had all the people that worked on the land. This is under, under the raja system. Mm -hmm. And so my ancestors that went to Fiji were the ones in the land, in the field. Mm -hmm. Right. There weren't the landowners. There weren't the aristocrats. There weren't the ones that had the privilege of, you know, uh, even sitting in the sacredness of ceremony. So we had our mm -hmm. own ceremonies. 
right? Mm -hmm. We weren't there with the pundits. We couldn't sit there with them uh, in those uh, old days, right? And then so in Fiji, that began to change. But in, so I share this with you to say is, is uh, there's two sides to it. So one is is one being less looked less upon and then the pressure that is going there. And the other is subscribing to that, that mm -hmm. I am lesser or I am this. And it's not an intellectual thing. Uh, I, in my own life, I've had to look at my behavior. What aspects of my behavior is a leftover legacy of colonial history where I have to, that I'm not entitled to that. That is not my right. Or I mm -hmm. should not seek that. Or that is a white thing. Or, you know. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I, we've been doing a lot of internal work ourselves to figure out our worthiness, our, our, our sacredness to be able to do that. And, and sometimes it's a struggle because it'll just cre creep up on you. With regard to COVID, there are the stories that I'm hearing from, from the different uh, aspects of people in different, different levels of it. So in the beginning, there were those groups that were like, this is such a blessing. Hmm. Because it's almost like I, I, I needed to turn things off, mm -hmm. but it's almost as if society at large had to just turn everything off. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, Bob Marley had a song called Rat Race, and it just seemed like everybody was in a rat race. Mm -hmm. And nobody amongst the average person had gotten to that point of joy, mm -hmm. of happiness. Mm -hmm. And that rat race was supposed to, if I keep struggling, if I keep working hard, I'm going to find joy, I'm going to find happiness. But everybody's working hard, but very few people have that joy and happiness. Yeah. And it just felt like COVID gave some people that space of like, just to be able to breathe. Mm. And then there were those that isolation and loneliness, because as human beings, remember when we were born, yes, there were people around us, but you were born with yourself. You didn't understand language. You just knew warmth. Mm -hmm. So that intellectual side of you wasn't developed. So you were just pure being. Mm -hmm. And so that pure being, there's a loneliness there because you're just pure being. And it gets to the point while being in that rat race, we forget that pure being side of it. And so that busyness aspect of it, of constantly trying to fill, uh, fill that busyness, it, it's tough for a lot of people. What the, what the, how it will play out, I'm not sure how it's going to play out. Society is going to have to ultimately decide how it's going to play out. Mm -hmm. What I do know from history, though, I come from a tradition that looks at time on a 25,000 year time span. Hmm. 25,000 years. So 1,000 years, 2,000 years, these are blinks of an eye. That's just one era, 25,000 years. And so there have been pandemics and epidemics. There have been raiders and invaders. There have been so many things that have happened to human beings, to life on the planet. But there is a force and a spirit on planet Earth hmm. that is ancient that it has no beginning, it has no birth. And that realm of just knowing that we are that, that thwam asi, that thou art, they say in Sanskrit. When Moses ascended the mountaintop, the voice of God, the voice spoke to, to Moses, the voice said, I am, I, singular, one, am, being, I am being, that I am. Hmm. And that spirit is all that exists, and we are part of that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I had a professor one time in Chinese medicine school, and I was all talking about, you know, the earth degrading and the world's coming to an end. And, you know, I was all in that zone. And, and I went to him, and he says, uh, you know, and, and I was trying to move him, man. Like, he wasn't moving emotionally, <laughs> you know. And the more, the more I tried, the less he moved. Uh, and uh, I tried to rile him up, and, and at some point he says, um, okay, let's play your worst-case scenario out. So we destroy the earth, the earth is gone, life uh, on the planet dies. Hmm. But life will not die. 
Mm. And that know that you are life. Mm. And the yin and yang is just where we're caught at. We're caught in these dimensions, but life will not die. Mm. And so knowing that, and no matter how hard things got, just knowing that there's this spirit that will not die, that has no birth, that Mm -hmm. fire cannot burn it, disease cannot kill it, water cannot wet it, and that we are of that, we inherited that, that is our nature. And so just as our ancestors, everybody, all the generations for millions and millions and millions of years that have come through and survived, we've inherited the DNA of survival. Mm -hmm. We've inherited the DNA of finding a way to not just make it, but to be able to survive and to thrive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so part of that struggle is, is, there's this really cool book. It's, it's called Man's Search for Meaning by Dr. Viktor Frankl. And in that book, uh, he talks about human beings. There's something, there's this incredible capacity for human beings to suffer. I mean, this guy talks about suffering in such a manner. I was like, damn, oh my God, where can I get some of that suffering? You know what I mean? Like, you know, has life gotten too comfortable? Can I, you know? Yeah. Uh, and but what he meant by it is, is, is that he said that there's something about suffering that all of a sudden, it is not so crazy if you know why, if you infuse some sort of a meaning and inheritance behind that suffering. And then he goes into this place where he goes, in fact, some human beings will invite suffering upon themselves just so as long as there's meaning behind it. And he gives this example. The book is full of examples. He gives this example of there's this elder uh, whose wife of like 50, 60 years had recently passed. And he was overcome with grief. And he was this elderly gentleman, and he was overcome with grief, and he was, you know, depressed. And Dr. Frankel has now had a, a successful uh, clinical practice here. He's teaching at a miniature university. And, uh, and he asked him, what would have happened if your wife lived and you had passed hmm. first? And then he says, uh, his demeanor changed. He goes, oh, my God, like, then she'd be suffering. And what a terrible thought, you know? Mm. He goes, could it be that in your infinite love for her, Mm. knowing that in this physical form, the way we see each other, it's not going to last, that there's going to come a day where we take our last breath. Could it be that your last ultimate and final testament of love for her was that she goes before you so you can bear that suffering wow. for her, so to spare her. Mm. Wow. That's, uh, that's deep. He though. lit up, yeah. and all of a sudden his suffering became noble. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yes, there's yeah. suffering that we have, and there's, a suf- there's sufferings that we can get rid of, and, and let's find the tools and resources to get rid of it. Right. And there's suffering that we carry because we carry it so the next generation don't. Right. If the pandemic right. was to happen, let it happen now, so let me bear that. Uh, and let's learn all we have to learn as a people, as a society, so we can get better for the next generation to come. Because that's all we do mm-hmm. as human beings. We get wow. better. Mm-hmm. That's deep, Attil. That's, that's, you know, that's, uh, you know and, and it's interesting because in, in, in my cultural teachings, we make a differentiation between sacrifice and suffering. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and sacrifice is what you need to do, what mothers do to bear children, what we need to do you know, for, uh, in order to get better, to, to move on in life. Suffering is that, is that aspect where there's no meaning. You know? So we make a differentiation. But what you talk about is that suffering with a sense of dignity, mm-hmm. you know, making, uh, doing something that's not comfortable for you, doing something you know, that, that you're not used to, maybe even doing something that is out of the course of what even your culture did in order to make it better for your children. And I'm going to share a story right here because I saw you exemplify that. You know, early on when, uh, when Rena was, was pregnant with Leela and we were talking and we were talking about, you know, how are you going to do this? Uh, you know, because you had to work and, you know, Rena was a teacher. She had to go to, 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 to go teach and who's going to change the diapers, right? 
And and <laughs> and and you were talking. About, I don't know who's going to change the diapers because you know Rena's at work, and I'm saying, well, what about you? Oh no, we don't do that in my culture. Yeah. Men don't change diapers. And I remember yeah. we had this discussion, right? Yeah. Right. And and I shared with you, and I, and I asked you, I said, so uh, you have a decision to make, Attil, right? Uh, if you don't choose to uh, deal with the poop or caca or whatever of your daughter. When she's six months, she's not going to come to you at 13. Yeah. She's not going to come to you at 15 when shit's happening in her life. Yeah. And I remember we had that conversation, and it kind of threw you back yeah. because it was, you know, it, it, it questioned the tradition, if you will. And, and what, it's, it, what, it, what I keep getting reminded of is you talk about the yin and the yang, the light and the dark, is some of the traditions in our cultures have come from fear of darkness, of, of, of you know, patriarchy, of all of those things, and we've incorporated some of those things. But what impressed me so much is because when you, your daughter was born, you loved her so much, you were willing to challenge the tradition to sacrifice what you thought was expected of you yeah. as a man yeah. and change your baby's diet. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and I see today the fruits of that. Yeah. When I see your daughters sit on your lap, even though they're getting bigger. Oh, yeah. You know, they're getting bigger and they, they, they got their own minds and their own ways. They still come and sit on your lap. Yeah. And so I see the fruits of that sacrifice that mm -hmm. you talk about, you know, um, in your relationships, you know. Oh. So I want to just acknowledge you for that. Because not only are you a wonderful, you know, uh, acupuncturist and a, and a good friend, a wonderful father, husband, but you, you live these principles that way, you know. And, and I just want to say that in front of all these people that, that are listening today. You know, as we, as we go to wrap up, um, I want to ask you, you know, because people are struggling you know, health-wise, they are struggling, you know, in, in in trying to balance out their fears and everything, you know, um, in, in all of that wisdom that come from your traditions, but also come from you as an acupuncturist. What kind of advice do you give to people that can help them in terms of staying healthy, uh, staying well, or even rebalancing if they're not feeling well? What kind of advice would you give them uh, to uh, so that they can fare better in terms of their well-being? Uh, thank you for acknowledging what you acknowledge. That's that's one of the the talks I actually shared with my patients. Uh, it's it's is Jerry's uh, famous diaper story, and I've, <laughs> I, I, I've turned that into a whole lesson. And and in fact, that story, uh, I, I, it used to be I couldn't talk about it unless I had a couple of beers in my system. <laughs> you know, now I don't need those beers because the fruits of that. And what made it that much more easier, uh, Jerry, was that. When I'd be in your presence and I'd see your grown kids walking in from whatever they were doing throughout the day, and no matter how many people were present, that they would literally walk up to you, give you a kiss on the cheeks, and you guys would have that split second of presence and oneness and stillness. It didn't matter what was going on. And I was like, man, I'm going to pretend he didn't just win the lottery with his kids, that that happened by design, that happened by intention and purpose. So when you were uh, sharing uh, the purpose of, you know, the diaper story, you, you flip my narrative. So my narrative of men don't do that to look at the nobility in this, mm -hmm. right? Look at the sacredness in this, because you're not mm -hmm. just uh, changing a swell diaper. You're letting no her know that you're here for her. Yes. And once I did that, oh man, I couldn't wait to change my first diaper because we had this <laughs> conversation when Rena was still pregnant. Right, and right. so honestly, like literally, every diaper I changed was like, oh my god! Like you know, it, it just became something extremely, extremely honorable. So you're absolutely right. Like there are some paradigms that need to be shifted, and we have to then walk away to be able to do that. It doesn't matter how many people have voices to the contrary that's in our immediate circle. When it's right for you, it's right for you. And so I share that with you to say is that in this time of COVID, that all human beings are given an enormous opportunity to get in touch with themselves and their relations. So yeah. when I would pray with the Lakota elders, they would say, Aho, Metakwiasi. 
to all my relations, to all my relatives. Now, of course, in their definitions, the relatives wasn't just their uncle, their aunts. When the mm-hmm. Lakota say, to all my relatives, they're talking about the tree people, the rock people, the thunder beings. They're talking about all things in creation. It is a huge, enormous opportunity for us to start with the relatives, the relations that are we're in close proximity with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There are people, many of us, that we haven't forgiven yet. And you don't forgive them. I mean, it might be nice to forgive them for them, but mm. you forgive them because forgiveness, as far as energy goes, it's a heavy energy. Yeah. There are people that we haven't asked forgiveness from. Mm. Even in our own hearts, Carolyn Mace, the great uh, healer and teacher, talks about how forgiveness is the ultimate act of selfishness. Because there's nowhere to run right now. You Mm -hmm. can't go anywhere. And so we are now confronted with all our insecurities, with all the things that are said, unsaid. So even when we, you know, how to hold each other again, how do we sit with each other again? It, we can look at it as like, oh my God, something cruel and unusual is happening to us. But we can also look at it as what if it's the flip side? What if the creator literally is omnipresent? Hmm. As every spiritual tradition talks about. Yeah. And if it is the creator is omnipresent, then could this even be sacred in a sense? Hmm. How many people have gone to funerals just to punch in the clock? Mm-hmm because you're supposed to do it. But now we're longing to be by the side. Yeah. How many people that, that you know, just your average everyday, your, your coworkers that would irritate you, that just to be in that space that we took for granted. Yeah. So whatever things that seem uprooted now, to those people that are uprooted now, chances are it was uprooted before this happened. So whatever opportunities that existed there existed now. And so if we look at it as the glass is half full and we start looking for places where the glass is half full, then we will find it. Uh, Wow. Beautiful uh, teachings. And, and, you know, until we could go on and we will go on, you know, (laughs) offline, we will go on. And, and, you know, I... I, um, just once again, you know, want to just acknowledge you and thank you, and not just you, Rena, as well, and your whole family, you know, who I consider part of our family, you know, you know, to thank them for their uh, sacrifice or suffering, to thank them for their teachings, to thank you for all that you do for so many people, you know, um, just with your spirit and your presence, but now with your skill as well, you know, acupuncture has helped me. Mm-hmm. You know, I've come to you and you've helped me, mm-hmm. you know, uh, because as, as spiritual as I want to be, sometimes I just want you to take away the pain right there in that, yeah. <laughs> in that lower back and the sciatic or whatever, you know, and, and you have the ability to do that too. And I think that's also part of the gifts that you carry, you know. And so I appreciate you, uh, you know, uh, if you, um, you know, want more information about uh, you know, Dr. Narayan, you can... Well, the, the the information will be with us right there on the on the podcast, and you can connect with him if you need to. Uh, if you're in the area, go, go get a session. You know, <laughs> but uh, to all our listeners, I you know I just really want to uh, reinforce what uh, what uh, Attil said in terms of the ability that we have to to forgive and to let go and and to build relationships and to build the sacredness within everything we do. This is a time in which uh, is a challenge, and and for some of us we're suffering, you know. But but how do we transform that suffering into something that's noble and that's dignified? How do we take that and and make it something that uh, that can feed and 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 breed positive medicine, healing medicine in in all our relations that way? It starts with us, you know. It starts with us acknowledging that, taking care of ourselves but also then looking inside and looking to the ancestral wisdom, ancestral medicine, and bringing it today into a practice, a practice that we then uh, becomes our tradition. You know, um, I want to thank you all for listening. And, uh, you know, again, send us reviews or reflections or comments. Uh, share this podcast with others. And, and, and just remember 
that you're a sacred and a blessing just the way you are. Know that, live that, and share that with others. Thank you all very much. Klaasu uh, Kumadli. For more information about Healing Generations and the Healing Generations Institute, visit nationalcompadresnetwork.org and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with our new releases.